Let's open our Bibles. Well, not yet. <laughs> it's going to say to Romans. I'm going to, I want to start this morning with something as uh, soon as we have prayer, though. Let's commit our time to the Lord. Father God, we bow before you this morning and greatly encouraged in your presence with us, in your love for us, in your work on our behalf. Father, how can we go wrong? We have every uh, divine blessing and enablement through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to be the people you've called us to be, Father, in all ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, two thoughts that crossed my mind this week on Wednesday, Wednesday evening and, and Thursday concerning the storming of our nation's capital. Number one, it crossed my mind that our nation seems to be out of control. That's a scary thought. Our future, coupled with that, our future seems uncertain. And I mean as a nation, as a people. We don't know what to expect. We don't really know what's happening and we really don't know what's going to happen. That's unsettling. When these thoughts come to you, as I'm sure similar thoughts came to your mind as well, we must always remember that God is in control. And God is sovereign over all. So I want to read, turn with me. I want to read some passages that say just that. Turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 46. I'd like to read three verses there. Isaiah 46. We will begin reading in verse 9. These are the thoughts that we have to focus on and keep our eyes on, as it were. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. That is a very powerful passage on the sovereignty of God, and he has established a timetable for all nations. At, at this point, well, no, I'll, I'll go back there in a minute. Um, and... We are going to be on his timetable. And what is happening to America right now, and who knows what's going to happen in the coming years, we just have to say God is in control. And if this nation is to endure, we will endure. And if we are going to be disciplined by the Lord because of our uh, turning away from him, then we're going to be disciplined. And whatever that means, I don't know. But God knows how to take care of his children, even in the middle of discipline. Let's turn to Isaiah 14. Although this is talking about the Assyrians. The principles of God's character here are absolutely eternal. 
uh, Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that I have purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? What's the answer to that question? No one. No one. And so we do well to focus on the Lord and not to be angry with the Lord and, realize, and be thinking various thoughts. The second thought I had is that evil seems to be prospering. You ever thought that? Evil prospers or seems to be prospering and seems to be advancing in our nation. Possibly to some degree, the stability and the predictability we have enjoyed in this prosperous nation for all of my life, and probably everyone can say that here today, This stability and this predictability that we have enjoyed may have to some degree caused our focus and our hope to be misdirected. Now that the nation seems to be falling apart in, in various ways, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Stock market's going to crash. This is going to happen, that's going to happen. And all of a sudden we start to, where was our focus before? Our focus was in the stability and the predictability of our nation. Stock market goes up and down, but generally it's always going to do well. We're always going to be a strong nation economically. What if that's not true? Where's our hope? In the USA? No. In God our Savior. Concerning this, turn to Psalm 37. <clears throat> Psalm 37, we'll read verses 12 through 14. There's a lot of plotting going on behind the scenes in our government, and a lot of it is not good, and some of it is even evil. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. We will be targets as we already know we are. But what does the Lord do? He laughs about that. He laughs because the people drawing the sword and bending the bow, he sees their end. We don't, he does. But we need to look to him. Turn to verse, where am I at? 18. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. 
but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows shall vanish into smoke, they shall vanish away. So when we see evil and wickedness all around us, we just have to have the Lord's attitude. They are going to perish, but we are going to last. They are not. Look at verses 35 and 36. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I have sought him, but he could not be found. Verse 39 and 40. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. May we truly keep our eyes upon the Lord. Let's turn now to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7. Uh, last, <clears throat> last week we got halfway through verse 17, uh, so we're, we, that's the verse we will begin with, just looking briefly at verse 16, just to catch the flow. But I just want to say as an intro and review, in this chapter Paul has recorded a time in his Christian life when he had a significant struggle. He wanted to be obedient to God, but he found himself doing the very things that he did not want to do. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been through that struggle, wanting to obey God, but not doing, but you find yourself not doing it? And you get frustrated with yourself. This is what this chapter is about. Let's begin reading. We'll read verses 15 through 18. Paul says, For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then... I do what I will not to do. I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do. Do not find in myself, as it were. In verse 16, Paul's desire to obey God's commandments, his law, meant that he agreed with the law, that it was good. But even though he desired to obey, he does what he desires not to do. He ends up disobeying God repetitively, consistently. Now verse 17, this is where we left off. Let me read. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Keep that in mind and turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. You see we have this inner battle going on. He says, it's not I who am doing this, but it's sin that dwells in me who is doing this. 
So in Galatians chapter 5, there's a key verse, verse, well, we'll read 16, but the one I really am focusing on is 17. Notice what Paul says. I say then, walk in the Spirit. That is in God the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall what? Not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you're walking in the Spirit, you will not sin. You will be obedient. And this is what Paul, this is the little link Paul was missing at this point in his life. The understanding that he lacked. So Paul draws a conclusion in verse 17. This struggle with sin in my life, it's not me. It's the sin that dwells in me, he says. Paul here is making a distinction between who he is in Christ and versus who he is when he's carnal and who is in control when he's carnal. He's sold under sin, as it said in verse 14. He's making a distinction between his position and his experience. And for the sake of explanation, it is as if Paul is uh, speaking verse 17, that there are two things inside of Paul that are contrary to each other. They're wrestling, they're fighting for control of us. The Spirit of God who indwells us and our flesh who wants to control us. And so this is a real battle that we see here. Paul is stating to us here what happens when he lives by his flesh but attempts to live the sanctified, holy, and righteous life. He says, it's not my new life that is doing this. It's not the new man that is doing this, disobeying. Rather, it is sin. Sin that is arousing my sinful nature. Sin that is arousing my old man. And we will define the old man. The old man is the former life that you had. We saw that in Ephesians 4, the former conduct, uh, lewdness leading to all immorality. That's our former life. That's our old man. But what does it say in Romans 6, 6? That our old man was crucified with Christ. That means the old man is dead. But when we give way to deceitful lust that emanate from our sinful nature, when we say yes to it, the old man comes alive. And our former conduct, our former life, living as unbelievers, becomes real for believers. Ephesians chapter 4, which we'll take a look at in a minute. <clears throat> And this is the minute. Turn to Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. We looked at this last week, but I briefly want to touch on it again because it's such an important point. This is talking about, like, like he just said in verse 17, it's not I who's doing it, but it's sin that dwells in me. It's this inner struggle that's going on. Old man, new man struggle. And here in, verses, in uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 17 of Ephesians, he begins, Paul, Paul begins, he's rebuking or exhorting these believers at Ephesus and saying, stop living like unbelievers. To put it in the context of what we we're just talking about, stop living according to your flesh. 
Stop living according to the old man. And so that's what he, he says uh, to them. And then when he gets down to verse, nine, uh, verse 20, he says, But you have not so learned Christ. What have, you, what have we learned from Christ? Did we learn that Christ was crucified on the cross, paid for our sins, freed us from the power of sin, only to go back and put ourselves under the power of sin? That's what he's saying. Stop. You, this is not what you learned about what Christ has provided for you. He's provided freedom from sin, and yet you go right back into enslavement to sin. This is not how you learned Christ. This is not what you learned about Christ and what he's provided for you. That's what Paul is saying. Verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. And by the way, that if clause is first class. That means the verb there, you have heard, is in the indicative mode, which means it's a state of reality. This is true. Yes, you have heard these things. Not if. Maybe you heard them. No. If and you did hear these things and you have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Here's what they were taught and here's what they heard. That you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man. Put off the old man. Which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust that emanate from your sinful nature. You keep saying yes to them rather than no. I have been freed in Christ. And then he says in verse 23, which is very, extremely important, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, if we are going to put off the old man then we need to continually be renewed in our mind about the identification truths of Romans 6. That Christ died to sin, I too died to sin. I can look, sin can look me straight in the face and I am dead to sin. And I am now alive to Him. As he rose from the dead, I too rose in newness of life that I could now for the first time in my life, I could be alive to God. That's what Paul is saying. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. There's where we are. When we put on the new man, we're dead to sin, we're alive to God. It is a life of true righteousness and holiness. We're, we're living in the new man. So this struggle inside of us, back and forth, the spirit and the flesh, the old and the new, we can have the victory because of the grace of God. Let's go back to Romans 7. <clears throat> after the first phrase of verse 17, after Paul says, It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What does that mean? Sin that dwells in me. <clears throat> I hate to say this to you, but after we are born again in Christ, we still possess the sinful nature that has been passed on to us through Adam. And our flesh is still our flesh. Our flesh did not get born again. Our flesh was not rejuvenated, regenerated, excuse me. <clears throat> our flesh is still our flesh and it continues to emit sinful desires. As Paul said in, in Ephesians 4, deceitful lust that dwell in us. 
We have the choice and enablement to say no to those sinful desires or we can pursue them. Paul says, it is no longer I who do it. He says this based upon the fact that he continues to do the very thing that he wills not to do. He says, I want to go this way, and I always end up going this way. It's not me. It's that, again, that inner struggle. And you may feel that if you're still breathing, you probably do. Paul desired to obey, but he disobeyed. At that point in Paul's Christian life, he naturally thought he could just will to obey God and fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. It's kind of a naive, beginning, baby Christian attitude we might have. That I'm saved now, this Christian life is going to be great. I'm going to just walk with God, and there's not going to be any problems. And then day two, we realize there are problems. We realize that we can't just will in and of ourselves to obey God. Even if we 100% desire to do that, we just can't will to obey God. It doesn't happen because in our flesh dwells no good thing. We don't have the power to do that. Paul did not take into account the weakness of his flesh. He did not understand his inability to obey God from his flesh. That, that he could not obey God from his flesh. And further, he didn't understand God's enablement, what God had done for him. The grace of God through the grace of Christ. And also, he didn't understand what happens when we walk according to the power of the Holy Spirit. When we're, when we're not grieving or quenching, we're filled with the Spirit of God and how the Spirit works in our lives. In other words, Paul didn't understand living according to divine enablement versus living according to his flesh. You see, there's only two ways that you and I operate. Let's look at Romans 8.4. I'm breaking into a verse just because of time's sake. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So when we walk according to the Spirit of God, Galatians 5, when we walk according to the Spirit of God, that means we're in harmony with God. We want His will. We want His desires. We're not grieving or quenching His Spirit. Then, guess what this verse says? When we're walking according to the Spirit, the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us by God. That is encouraging. Now I want to draw a distinction, as I said I was going to. I want to make a distinction between the sin nature and the old man. I mean, there were many years that I didn't really, I, I just took the old man as the sin nature, and the sin nature is the old man, but I believe the scriptures teach very clearly, even in Ephesians 4, that the old man is your former unregenerate, unregenerate state of being. It's who you were. It's your life when you were an unbeliever. So the sin nature is not the old man. We received our sin nature from Adam, Romans 5, 12. And our sin, our sin nature is like the motor that drives the old man. If you can picture that, the car being the old man, the motor being that which drives it. Without a motor under the hood of your car, your car is going nowhere. The sin nature 
is the active part that drives the old man, arouses, incites the old man, tempts, lures, deceives the old man with deceitful lusts. We'll look at a slide in just a minute that will uh, illustrate this. But while in saying all of that, when Christ died to sin, we died to sin as well, such that we are freed from sin. And Romans 11, 6, 11 says, and exhorts us to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And when we are dead to sin, our sin nature can be waving flags and trying to lure us, and we're dead to sin, period. But this exhortation indicates something, that we have to make a choice to be dead to sin and alive to God. It also indicates that a believer can be alive to sin and dead to God by choice. When we identify with the death of Christ, the result is dead to sin. This means though we have a sin nature, which we all do, our old man, which is dead, Romans 6.6, 6, our old man has been crucified with Christ. Our old man is dead and he cannot be affected by the sinful nature trying to drive him, fuel him, take him where he shouldn't go, where he doesn't have to go. Another way of saying it is the works of the old man, the works of our old man are fueled by the sin, by our sin nature. And we cannot, I, sorry again to, to say, we cannot improve the old man, I mean the sinful nature. But we can have victory over our sinful natures. We can reckon the old man to be dead to sin. Turn with me back to Romans 6. Let's read that now that we've been talking about that. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man, our former life, was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. That's where we're at, praise God. That's the ground we can stand on every day if we allow ourselves to. And a, and a parallel verse, which I, uh, I love this verse, I, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. If, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And this is true of our, that's true of our salvation. But it's also, we can set aside the grace of God in the Christian way of life and say, I've got this. We don't say it, but unconsciously we just go about our life trying to gut out obedience to God when we don't have it within us. There has to be a conscious awareness of relying upon God and being in fellowship with him i who's the i there who was crucified with christ i my former life was crucified with christ it's no longer i who live but now christ lives in me wow 
That's powerful. That's almost like Romans 7, 8, 4, where the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Now I don't live. Christ lives in me. Wow. Is that true in your life? That's a lot to chew on, isn't it? That's a lot to think about. Am I going to let Christ live in my life or am I going to live in my life? That's what we're up against. All right, now let's go to uh, this illustration. All right, simple nature. Every one of us has a sinful nature. From our sinful nature constantly, it, it seems, our sinful nature emits sinful thoughts and desires which sometimes just pop into our minds. You, you ever say, where did that thought come from? You ever get disgusted with yourself? Where did that thought come from? Came down from your toes. From your sinful nature. Deceitful lust emanate. And, and things pop into your mind. Now, has sin been committed when this thought pops into your mind? No. Read James 1, 14 and 15. I'm not going to go over that right now. But when a sinful thought pops into your mind, you have two options, yes or no. You have the option you can dismiss. Say, no, I'm not going there. You just dismiss that thought. And when you do, you remain alive to God. And you're walking according to the new man. You've put on the new man. He's still on. You haven't put him off. You also, in your mind, you claim that, listen, why should I entertain that thought? My old man was crucified with Christ. Why am I going to go there? We realize the old man is dead with Christ and remains dead to the, de to the desires that may pop into our minds. Or you can take option two. You can entertain. You can entertain this thought. Why is it easy to do that? Because that's our flesh. Our flesh wants that sinful thought. Our stinking flesh craves for that. But we shouldn't go there as children of God. What happens when you entertain that thought? Well, number one, you give birth to sin. Number two, you have just put on the old man. You're back to your former way of life as an unbeliever. Number three, you just presented the instruments, the members of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness, minus righteousness. You are now, as it were, an agent to work unrighteousness. Isn't that terrible thought? And you've placed yourself under the dominion of sin. You've gone back to sin. Now let me ask you, how does option one work? How does option one become real in my life? That I would want to, that I would be able to dismiss that sinful thought. Very quickly, by faith. By faith, you have turned to the grace of God and his divine enablement to say no. You, you're very conscious of God at that point. And you say, no, I'm not, I'm not going there. Secondly, 
You reckoned yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Thirdly, or other thoughts you may have had, my old man's been crucified. I don't have to be alive to sin. I've been freed from sin. I've been freed from the power of sin. Why would I return? And thirdly, I'm under God's grace. And then the last question I ask, how is this most likely to happen? How, is, how do I nurture this kind of response in my life? That this becomes me. Not me all the time, maybe. But it becomes more natural for me to just dismiss sin. Sin that pops into my mind. Thoughts that pop into my mind. How am I more likely to dismiss sin? Well, my spiritual posture is I have been in prayer and I have desired and prayed for a relation, my relationship with God to be closer than ever before. And as you ask God by faith, that your walk with him would be closer than it's ever been in your entire life, I believe something starts to change. In my relationship, it's closer with God now. I have, my love grows as the relation grows. My love for him grows. My reverence for him grows. And I find myself more occupied with Christ than ever before. And when these thoughts pop into my mind from my sinful nature, which is alive and well, I'm in a spiritual place where I say, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to think about that. It starts with prayer, asking God, God, draw me near, nearer to you. And you grow in your love, you grow in your reverence for God, your adoration for God, and you're more occupied with him in your mind. And when a, and when a sinful thought comes in, boom, no, dismiss it. That's your, that's your job. That's your responsibility to bring yourself or allow God to bring you to this place where you have this spiritual, spiritual posture. And you can have the victory, not because you're, you've done anything, it's because you're allowing God to do everything. Now, in, in closing, when we live under the principle of law, sin has dominion over us. Living under law means I'm not living under grace. It means I do not have any divine enablement. It means I'm left alone with just my flesh, of which I can't come through with my flesh. I'm not going to be obedient to God. The law tells you how to live, but neither it nor your flesh can by any means help you or allow you to obey and fulfill the law. So when you put yourself under law, when you try to do everything yourself, you put yourself under the rule of sin. So what is the grace of God in the context here? Through Christ... We are able to be dead to sin and alive to God as well. We have been given the indwelling spirit, the spirit of life, who works in in us and through us. These divine blessings are actualized or they become real in our lives when we walk and live according to the Holy Spirit in harmony with him. And I leave you with this last thought from This is taken from the illustration that Christ gave in in John chapter 15. Think of this. The branch, and that's you and I, the branch that abides in the vine 
has all of the enablement of the vine flowing through him or her. But if the branch is not abiding in the vine, he or she has no enablement from the vine and cannot bear any fruit no matter how much he or she wants to, and then sin has dominion over you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. By the power of your spirit, Father, cause these truths to be implanted in our souls and lived out in our lives to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, welcome to the communion service where we recall uh, uh, the beginning of our eternal life uh, with Christ, uh, remembering what he did for us um, on the cross and uh, all that that means for us. Today I wanna think about the aspect of what Christ did on the cross, uh, the aspect of uh, us being cleansed, cleansed from the, from the penalty of uh, sin, uh, our sins being taken away by Christ on the, on the cross. And I, I've always been kind of curious about being washed by the blood of Christ. Uh, we have songs, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Are you washed in the blood, the blood of the lamb? Um, so I would think, you know, how does blood clean? You know, I would think if I clean myself with blood, I, I would end up being dirtier than I started with. So the blood of Christ, we all know it represents the work that he did on the cross. It's not physical blood that makes us clean. It's what the blood, blood stands for. And what are we made clean of? Uh, not a physical stain, but a, a spiritual stain, the sin that separates us from the most holy God. So what can wash away my sin? Only the substitutionary death of the Lamb of God, the perfect one, in my place, All right, substitutionary. In the physical realm, only a clean object can remove the filth of an unclean object. Only water, clean water can wash away the soil of a filthy garment. And spiritually, only the perfect Lamb of God can take away the sin of the world. So I'm going through uh, some steps here. First of all, Jesus Christ was born, uh, he was God before he was born in the flesh. John 1, 1 to 5, in the beginning was a word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. So he was God, totally pure, no sin, no stain. First P Peter tells us in uh, First Peter 1, 17 to 20, it ends with, uh, you have not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so God, the second person of the Trinity, the perfectly holy righteous one, became flesh. And as we saw as we celebrated Christmas, all the, a lot of dimensions of that. But John 1, 1 14, go, John goes on to say, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And uh, meditating on the perfectly holy, righteous God entering his creation in, in human flesh without sin, living in a, a sin-cursed world, just being born and living in the world, uh, all the aspects of that, but he himself was perfectly righteous. He was born, uh, he had human flesh, 
and that enabled him uh, to represent mankind at the cross as the, our federal head. He would not have been able to do that if he didn't take on uh, the body. He bore our sins in his own body. First Peter again, chapter two, starting in verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. He bore our sins. As I said before, you have to have a, a clean object in the physical realm uh, to take away filth in the f physical realm. And this is here where Christ was taking on the perfectly righteous, uh, holy son of God, taking on our sin in his flesh, on his bot in his body, taking it from us. and he paid the sin debt. He absorbed the sin in his flesh. He stood in our place and he paid the sin debt. He paid the full price, the sin penalty paid and removed from us. It was removed from us, from our account. And this is how we were cleansed by the payment of the sin debt in full by Christ, drinking the cup of the wrath of God. And if you go to the Old Testament, looking at some of the sacrifices, you have blood in, in some of the cases, uh, especially the, when a leper was, uh, was healed, they would have a ritual, uh, they would uh, have the blood of a sacrifice and then a ritual washing that would declare, after the priest would declare them cleansed. So there was the blood, the payment, and the results of the blood, the cleansing from the sin. Uh, we see that in the tabernacle when the priests would enter uh, into the temple. First, they chose to enter uh, the first gate, made a sacrifice, chose to make that sacrifice. The sacrifice was made. Then there's a laver uh, showing the cleansing the cause and effect, the result of the, the payment being paid, then they could enter into fellowship, into the temple in fellowship and take in the revelation of, of, of God. And even the high priest once a year could enter the Holy of Holies, the very, um, be in the very presence of God. In Hebrews, uh, the writer actually talks about this. He links the Old Testament sacrifices to what's happened to us and Hebrews 9, 22 to 28. He says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in, he in the heavens should be purified with these, the physical realm in the Old Testament, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. I'm jumping down, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. So that's what Christ has done, what Christ was doing at the cross, the perfectly uh, spotless Lamb of God, unblemished Lamb of God provided by God the Father, provided a human uh, uh, flesh, representing all humanity on the cross, taking on our sins in his body, uh, suffering the wrath of God, suffering spiritual death, separation from God the Father for the, the only time in eternity, uh, paying the penalty, paying the sin debt. And 
So we remember that today. We, we accept this through faith in Christ. And we have cleansing. We accept that cleansing for ourselves. We accept what Christ did for us on the cross and we receive that cleansing through his sacrifice as pictured by the blood of Christ on the cross. And uh, verses, many verses that, to support that after this happens, we receive forgiveness of sins. We're reconciled back to God. Uh, we're declared justified, righteous in, in Christ because now we're united with Christ by accepting the fact that he stood for us and he died in our place, my place. And I could go on and on, but I won't. But it's all, it affects all, as we call it, three phases of salvation. Uh, entry into uh, the family of God through accepting what Christ did on the cross, our Christian way of life. Uh, we are able to live the Christian way of life as Larry's been teaching us based on what Christ did on, on the cross. And our future destiny is assured. Uh, we know that eventually we'll be free of the sin cursed world. We'll be free of our sin natures. We'll be with Christ forever. Uh, all based on the cross. So I guess we'll go ahead and distribute the elements. Okay, I'll just uh, say a quick prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread that recalls to mind uh, Jesus Christ person, perfect and holy even living in this world. And we're grateful that he humbled himself even to the point of cross, the cross, out of humility and love towards you and love for us out of his grace. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he gave, had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Father, we thank you for this cup that represents the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross in our place. That his relationship with you was severed there on the cross and he suffered your wrath, he paid their full sin debt and we're just grateful for these things in his name. Paul continues, and in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you.